So the pain of separation is part of the immigrant experience. And another woman in this book, a wonderful a woman from Vietnam, uh, uh, described herself and her family and people like the Banerjee's as the sacrifice generation. I love this phrase uh, because what she meant by it was that um, uh, the people who make this journey are never fully at home in the new country but can't go home again either. And they're suspended between these worlds. And um, when you say, when people say to me, well, what did she mean by sacrifice? What were they sacrificing for? I can sum most of that up in one word. And that word is children. Yes, freedom and liberty are words you can use, but in the end, the most powerful motive is children and making a new life for them. Because only the next generation, it's going to be Priyanka uh, and, and her generation, who are going to be fully um, at home in the country, and Asis and his wonderful wife, Indira, who couldn't come today, are the ones who made that sacrifice for their children to come here. And it's true in every one of our families. Um, and the Vietnamese story is particularly striking because uh, this family had tried a um, dozen times to get out of Vietnam. Uh, uh, this woman's husband was an officer in the Vietnamese Navy, and he knew the date uh, Saigon fell, there was no future for his family in, in, in Vietnam. They tried time and time and time again, and he finally got into a boat that made it past the um, coastal uh, guards, and uh, was. F but then once they got into the open sea, the motor conked out, they were floating aimlessly in the sea, and there was no there was no uh, water left on board. This woman had two small children. And she said, the next, the next thing I could do to save my children would be to cut open my wrist and feed my children my blood. She didn't have to make that sacrifice because the next day they saw land. But in that period in Southeast Asia, if you washed up on the shores of Thailand, you'd be free. But if you washed up on the shores of Cambodia, you'd be killed. And they did not know what the land was. Think of this. They didn't know. They saw this green land in the distance. And, um, uh, man calls out. He's standing in the prow of the ship. He described it to me. Uh, Chuk, Chuk Wan. And he, he, he describes calling out and saying, where are we? And the answer came back. Thailand, and they were safe. The answer was Cambodia, they wouldn't be here. And they had a, a their, the mother was pregnant at the time, and uh, uh, they were taken in in Thailand, and then they uh, moved to the Philippines where a daughter was born in the refugee camp, who later became my student at George Washington University. And her name is Thai Fee, for Thailand and the Philippines, the two countries that gave her uh, family sanctuary. But uh, there are also some things that are very different about, about immigration today. Uh, one is the feminization of immigration. Um, uh, historically, it was largely men who came to this country, in large part because they were the ones who had the jobs, at the muscle in the factories of Cleveland or the mines of Pennsylvania or building the Erie Canal and all the great, or the Chinese who built the railroads in the West. These were jobs that did not necessarily require a lot of education, but they did require a lot of muscle. Of course, there were always women who came, and always women who worked, and always women who died. The women who were killed in the Triangle Shirtwaist fi Factory fire in 1910 were about 130 uh, Polish and Italian immigrant women. But what has happened is that the, a lot, as the, as the, um, there's been a shift in the economy, and a lot more of the jobs available to immigrants today are jobs in the service industries, not the heavy uh, lifting jobs, and they're in healthcare and, and, and areas like that. I was telling some folks earlier, when my 91-year-old mother um, was in the hospital recently, every single person, every single one who took care of my mother was a foreign-born woman of color. Every single one. I bet here in Cleveland, the same as in Washington or Bayonne, you took the foreign-born women out of the hospital system here, the medical system would collapse overnight. Collapse overnight. And a lot of these opportunities now for foreign-born women are much greater than some ways for the immigrant men. So this has been a shift in the economic underpinning, but also the cultural reasons. Historically, it was hard for a lot of women to immigrate. There was the cultural shibboleth against it, and the idea that you had to be protected by a man and supported by a man, a lot of that has changed. 
So uh, uh, women uh, represent an enormous uh, part of the immigrant story today. Um, and the percentages of working women in some immigrant communities is astounding. Filipinos, 84% of Filipino women work outside the home. Jamaican community, 82%. These are very, very hardworking people uh, who contribute enormously to this country. The second thing that's different um, is, um, uh, is communication. Uh, when my grandfather, Avram Rogovsky, came from Bialystok, he was out of touch with his own family for 50 years. He had a sister living in Moscow who he did not talk to for 50 years. She was behind the Iron Curtain. She was, you know, the Holocaust had, 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 had separated the family. He only found her late in both of their lives when a cousin got out of Russia, made his way to Israel, and got in touch with my grandfather and said, by the way, your, your sister Tonya is still alive in Moscow. And they eventually did see each other before they both died. I have a student today who's from Brazil. And she, her brother married an immigrant from Brazil, and the uh, bride's family couldn't make their way to America. They couldn't get visas for the, uh, uh, for the trip. So my student, in her bridesmaid's dress, with a laptop and a, uh, and a digital camera, went to the wedding took pictures of the wedding, put them up on the web, and the bride's family in some tiny village in rural Brazil saw the wedding in real time in the slideshow that she put up on the web. So there's a very there's a great difference in terms of the uh, communication. And the other is the uh, entrepreneurship, which Assis is such a wonderful example of. The fact is that um, uh, immigrants have an enormous advantage in some kinds of commerce. They know the language. They know the communities. Uh, they know the cultural um, patterns of commerce, and, um, and many of them um, uh, are really international citizens. Uh, uh, Assis has a factory in Medina and a factory in Tamil Nadu in southern India, and he runs both of them. Um, he lives in Medina, but as he says, uh, you know, in some ways he, he really lives in the first-class lounge in Frankfurt as he's <laughs> flying around the world. Um, but um, he's a wonderful example of how... Um, Today, um, uh, you know, when I was growing up in America, in, in Bayonne, sure, there was an Italian family that imported olive oil. But today, particularly with Asia and particularly with India and China, um, uh, there's an enormously vibrant commerce. And immigrants are right at the center of that commerce for those, those reasons. Um, but um, in the end, this book is about stories. And it's a book about families. And it's a book about this journey. And I want to tell you quickly a couple of them, and then I'll get to your questions. One of the families that is, um, I, I got to know very well, also was the, their son was a student of mine, was the uh, Stern family. They grew up in Kharkov in the Ukraine, a uh, Jewish family that was uh, uh, repressed and, and, and discriminated against, uh, Sarah and Nick. The only, job, the only education they could really get was in, as engineers. They were barred from any other profession as young Jews. And they met in their first job. And I said to, them, I said to uh, Sarah, how did you start thinking about life outside of this dusty, dusty dirty um, uh, provincial capital of Kharkov in the Ukraine? She said, well, for instance, uh, some of my family friends started immigrating to Israel. And um, uh, a, uh, uh, one a family friend wrote to my mom. And she read me this letter where this woman said, you know, here in Israel, we eat oranges the way you eat potatoes. And it became the image, the symbol of a life outside of Russia, this orange. And then she said, we'd occasionally get movies from these communist directors. The Soviets would not let any American movies in, but the Italian communist directors, they'd show their movies. Fellini and Ponti and people like that. And she said, I never watched the stories. I was interested in the apartments. I wanted to see the bathrooms <laughs> and the kitchen. Um, and they finally, after long struggle, were able to make their way. But there was at the time, and of course you here in Cleveland know this very well because the late great Charlie Vanek was such a wonderful force in, uh, um, in uh, the legislative area in helping uh, Jews uh, leave the former Soviet Union. And of course Mark Talisman was his chief aide on, on, during a lot of that great legislative work that Congressman Vanek did. It's a great legacy what they both uh, contributed. And, uh, uh, if you could get information out to the Hebrew Immigration Society in Vienna, they could file a, a, an application to have you leave and reunify with your family. It was all a fiction. 